Today we're going to talk about the Transfiguration. Now when you read the version from Luke, it says that Jesus is talking to Moses about his upcoming exodus. Now the second book of the Bible is called the book of Exodus. And it tells the story of Moses leading the people out of slavery. So we may, may have to ask ourselves, how is Jesus going on an exodus? So we need to take a look at what happened with Moses. Then we can better understand the connection with Jesus. A lot of things in the Old Testament are symbols for what will happen in the New Testament or the New Covenant. So how is Jesus like Moses? How is Jesus going to deliver us from slavery and lead us to the promised land? So we need to take a look at the symbols and understand their spiritual symbolism. So the Hebrews were physical slaves of the Egyptians. And Moses leads them out of slavery to the Promised Land. Now the Promised Land is a symbol for heaven. And the slavery that they had was physical. But even worse is spiritual slavery to sin. So Jesus comes to break the bonds of sin and make us free. So how does he do that? If we remember the 10 plagues, the last one was the worst, the death of the firstborn. It's so bad that Pharaoh says to Moses, go and you'll be doing me a favor. Because the angel of death comes and kills all the firstborn of the Egyptians. Jesus takes this plague upon himself. He is the firstborn son of God. And he dies on the cross to free us from slavery to sin. And he pays the ransom uh, um, for our freedom. So then we see Moses leads his people across the Red Sea. St. Paul talks about how that is a symbol for baptism. So when we are baptized, we are washed clean of sin. Set free from the ransom to the devil. And then we go and we receive the other sacrament of the Eucharist. 
Now, when they crossed the Red Sea, we have learned something interesting. Most of the places where the shore is, they drop straight down several hundred feet to the bottom of the river. But with sonogram, they can see the floor under the Red Sea. I mean sonar. <laughs> I said sonogram. Sonar. So what they found is a spot that looks like a giant boat ramp that is wide and gradually goes down to the bottom on one side and comes up the other. So when God worked the miracle of pushing the water back, they were able to walk down and back up to the other side. And the Egyptian soldiers that chase them they are a symbol for our sins and then the water comes back they are buried. So modern divers have found in this spot um, Egyptian chariots. Egyptian helmets and swords and shields. Skeletons of horses and men. So this is powerful evidence for what happened uh, in the Bible. They also found the Rock of Moses. When the people are in the desert, Moses strikes a rock and water flows from it. So they found this rock that looks like it was cut in half by a laser. It's perfectly straight. And in the soil, they find residue of what uh, the water used to flow from it. But there's nothing there, no spring. So more evidence for the truth of the Bible. Now Moses got in trouble because he hit the rock twice. And you say, well, isn't God being a little sensitive? Well, Scripture, St. Paul tells us the rock is a symbol for Christ. So Christ is crucified one time and his side is pierced once. And when the soldier pierces the side of Christ, water and blood flow. So this rock, which was a symbol for Christ, has the water flowing, which is a symbol for the sacrament of baptism. <clears throat> So let's go back to the Passover. What's passing over? <clears throat> the angel of death. So only the houses that had the blood of the lamb on the doorposts
and the two doorposts, vertical and horizontal beam, remind us of the cross. So the blood of the lamb is on the doorpost. And the blood of Christ is on the cross. Part of the Passover meal was to eat the flesh of the lamb that was slaughtered. John the Baptist says that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So the lambs that were slaughtered for centuries were just symbols. Because the Old Testament is symbols and the New Testament is reality. They would also eat unleavened bread with the wine in the Seder meal. Now, why did they eat unleavened bread? Because they didn't have time to put the leaven in. It takes longer. But they are leaving the slavery of Egypt in haste. And we are leaving slavery to sin in haste. We want to get away from sin and we want to get to grace. Grace is God's life within us. So Jesus took the Passover meal and he transformed it into the Mass. So when the Jews ate the Passover meal, they were protected from the angel of death. The Egyptians did not eat that, and so their firstborn died. <clears throat> now there's something worse than that angel of death coming. The angel of the second death. Not the death of the body, but the death of the soul. The good news is we have with our free will a way out. We can choose to join in the exodus that Jesus is leading. So as the Hebrews crossed through the Red Sea, we are cleansed by the sacrament of baptism. They ate the flesh of the lamb. Jesus says in John chapter 6, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life. And in teaching on the Eucharist in John chapter 6, the starting point for Jesus is using a symbol of the Eucharist in the Old Testament. Jesus says, your fathers ate the manna, the bread that fell from heaven in the desert. but they died. I will give you the true bread that comes from heaven. And when you eat this bread, you will live forever. And then he says, I am the bread of life. I am the living bread come down from heaven. 
So how do we receive this bread? At the Mass. Jesus comes down from heaven to the altar at the consecration. And then he comes to you in Holy Communion. And you receive the antidote to sin. The supernatural, grace-filled meal to get rid of the poison of sin. Now, something kind of interesting. Where did they go after they crossed the Red Sea? Before they got to the Promised Land, they had to cross a big desert. Where does Jesus go after he's baptized by John the Baptist? Into the desert to be tempted by the devil. What do we say when we're baptized? We say we renounce sin and Satan. And then from baptism until judgment, we are in a battle. Against sin. We need to pray every day. To say no to sin. So we are on a journey, an exodus. Our whole life we are journeying from the, the house of slavery to sin. To the final destination of the promised land or heaven. So we have two exodus. At the end of our life, we ex exit from this body and our soul goes into eternity to God and the other exodus is what we're doing now, exiting from sin, spending our lives growing in grace. So the exodus of Jesus that he spoke to Moses and Elijah about at the transfiguration is also twofold. Jesus exits his body when he dies on the cross. But he's also sacrificing on the cross and paying the debt for sin for our exodus. So Moses led his people on a physical journey. From physical slavery in Egypt to the physical promised land. But Jesus leads us from spiritual slavery to sin to the, the paradise of heaven. Which is eternal. So when we see the story, Jesus shines like the sun. What does that mean? It's the one time that we know of from Scripture that the apostles see the divinity of Christ on a physical level. Other than that, Jesus looks like an ordinary man. <clears throat> What about us? Are we transfigured? Yes, we are. 
Now when I look in the mirror, I can tell if I'm having a bad hair day. Only in my case, it's more like no hair day. But I can't see my soul. We see our soul when we look into our conscience. Then we can tell better whether we have the light of God's grace within. Or if we have the darkness of sin within. Symbolizing the death of the soul. Separation from God. And a frightening connection to the second death. Which is the worst. Now when we look at the stained glass windows and the statues. They have these little uh, rings of light called halos. Now that is a symbol of the light of God's grace within the soul. So that's sort of our transfiguration. Now on the day we die, we should be able to see ourselves as a being of light. Our ultimate destiny is in the cloud of heaven with the angels and saints. We don't belong down here with the animals. But we need to be careful. Because if we follow our lower desires and sinful desires, then we can miss our chance to be with the angels and saints in heaven. So this is a critical time. We need to make sure we put light in our soul through baptism and faith. And we keep it there through a life of prayer and obedience. On the day we die and meet Jesus face to face, we shouldn't be meeting a stranger for the first time. We should be spending our lives walking with God in prayer. Reading and hearing and living the Word of God. Receiving Christ in the Eucharist. Spending time with Him in prayer and adoration. So this is our Exodus journey. It's a spiritual one and it is here and now. So we need to do our best to avoid the darkness and death of sin. In uh, God's providence, he gave us the sacrament of confession. So if we commit a serious or mortal sin after baptism, we can be restored to grace by that sacrament. So let's remember, the angel of death struck down the firstborn of Egypt. But the angel of the second death is even scarier. And our only, only hope of protection from him 
is by becoming one with Christ. So let's do our best to recognize what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And how he raised himself from the dead uh, uh, at the resurrection. And if we are one with him, he will do the same for us. Our home is with Jesus in heaven. Let's make sure we don't miss that for some lesser things here on earth.